All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Now, today we're going to have a fun uh, conversation. You know, usually these chats are super PC and uh, no drama. But today we have, you know, he, he, he may be the most hated man in hard rock or the most loved, depending on who you ask. We're going to talk to Stevie Rochelle about the 30th anniversary and the re-release of Tuff's album, What Comes Around, Goes Around. And then we are also going to talk a little bit about his website, Metal Sludge. All of that and more after this. All right, here he is. The man, the myth, the legend, Stevie Rochelle. What's up, Jason? Thanks for having me on uh, your podcast. I'm glad that you were able to do this. You know, Stevie, either you could have spent your afternoon wasting time with so many guys doing these things in their living room these days. You know, everyone's got a, a YouTube channel. So I'm glad you chose mine. Yeah, well, I've, I've you know, honestly, I've chose yours, but I've also chose some others because I got stuff to talk about and present and promote with the, uh, you know, the, the big news coming out of the tough camp you know, that we're, we're reissuing our debut. So, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I watched a bunch of your episodes, know most of the people you've interviewed and I find them, uh, I find them well done. Inter interesting. You're, you're, uh, you got a good, you got a good thing going here. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I'm, and uh, it means a lot coming from you because you see a lot of what these other people do as well. You're, you know, you're up to date on what's going on. So um, it's a, it's a good compliment that you watch this stuff and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so, we, yeah, we got a lot to get into. I, I got to say first, I've been like studying up on these tough diaries, which are on the Metal Sludge website. And so right. everybody can go to metalsludge.tv and, and check these out. You should. There's going to be 25. I think you're up until 18 now. Yeah, 17 or 18. I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm at 17 and pu are published. So I, I would say I get through the first one and I go, this guy didn't do drugs. You know, uh, and, and this is before you even say that. As I go on, you confirm that. But I'm thinking, right. this guy has an amazing memory of his career. I talk to people every single day, and a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of the facts I give them are new to them, where you have kept a really amazing, organized um, a list of events of your whole life. Right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, over the years, it's not like I ever kept a diary, but even, uh, you know, for anybody that's over 40, before cell phones, we used to have a little black book, mm -hmm. you know, or a little red book or a blue book or a Rolodex. And we keep all the numbers of the people we met or the girls we dated or the contacts we had. And um, over the years, those little books, you know, they'd fall apart and break down and then you'd get a new one and add new numbers. And I never threw those books out. I would put those books in a file cabinet under phone books in the P and in this folder was one, two, three. And eventually some years ago, I, I actually was digging around in the file cabinet. I found a, a folder with like six or seven phone books in it that I had since the early mid eighties, like since 84, 85, when I still lived in Wisconsin and I'm looking through there and like looking at, you know, Lisa's phone number and like put a star next to her name and she lived in Appleton or something, you know, and I was in Oshkosh. And so I just kept those over the years. And um, then as I got to LA, I started, you know, getting numbers and meeting people and hanging out with people and so much time had passed. But when I looked at these and it was a few years ago, I, I've shared these on Instagram and, and social media. Maybe you saw it. I'm looking through like turning the pages through say M and I see like a Brett Michaels, there's like a phone number for Brett Michaels. And I'd see, you know, Nikki Six's phone number, like whether it was his or not, or his address, we used to drive by his house and be like, dude, that's where Nikki lives, you know, had all this random stuff, you know, porn stars, numbers, you know, models, actresses, other rock stars, guys in bands. And so I started sharing some of these on, on social media. It was interesting just to look back and all the writings faded and I'd have little notes next to people's names. And, and I did the same thing with calendars, you know, the, the 99 cent store calendar that you buy and you hang in your kitchen with, you know, race cars, whatever. I make little notes, doctor's appointment, Tuesday, such and such Wednesday, do this on Friday. And when the year's done, I don't throw the calendar out. I put it in the file cabinet 
in the seas with calendars. So I have calendars for the last 30 years. You know, I, I know where we played on, you know, July 9th of 1989 at First Rock, you know, in St. Louis, Missouri. And Frankie Muriel and Broken Toys opened up for us, who eventually got signed and became King of the Hill. So all those little notes, at some point I go refer to those file cabinets when I'm writing the tough diaries, like on 1988 or 1990 and dig through, plus tour books. You know, we always kept, had tour books, so I kept all of them and dig through them and find out little notes. And that's how I put those diaries together. Yeah, I, I dig seeing that. You're a historian of of that scene. It's not just your band, but you were a fan right. of the bands before you got to LA and you're, you were a yep. fan after and always sort of a a music business insider. And so when you read these, I love that you even go to like Google images and show a picture of the uh, the, the house that Tuff lived in. I, I think that it's fun to see that history. Yeah. And, right. you know, we know the history of Motley Crue. We've heard it a million times or Guns N' Roses. And I think it's kind right. of fun to hear this about maybe a band that was smaller, but meant something to a lot of people, you know, over a hundred thousand copies of that first record. Um, sold, these people would be interested in, in some of that history too. Before we dive into too much TV, I have to say, there's never been a guy who's had a, you know, a, a smaller band. I don't mean that as an insult, but, and has made the, mo uh, the most of it. 30 years later, you've kept this tough brand alive. And, and right. more than any band I could think of from that era, you know, you still play the shows. You look, you've been through a lot of lineups, but you still play, you still put right. out the product you still keep it relevant. And I think that that's exciting to people who followed your journey. Yeah, well, one thing is I'm not a quitter. I've always said to myself, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna work on stuff. I'm getting a little echo there. Is that you or? I don't hear any echo on you. Okay. A little um, bit now. So, you know, I've never been a quitter. I've always wanted to go forward. And, um, you know, the, the band went for about a decade. You know, it was originally formed in 85. I came in in the, you know, spring of 87. And by the end of 95 is when me and George, the guitarist, were still playing out there. We had been through three bass players and three drummers and three record labels and three booking agents. And, you know, at some point it was just like, okay, the, the black cloud over our head, known as the, the mid-90s or grunge, Seattle, whatever you want to call it. It was just, we were killing ourselves to get 200 bucks in... Seymour, Indiana on a Sunday, you know? And so at that point, that's when I pulled the plug. And I remember we came home, it was around Thanksgiving. So it was the very end of 95. It was a solid 10 years. And um, I said, okay, well, this is done. You know, we had all these road cases. I'm like, George, you take those, I'll take these. Oh, I could probably sell these on, in the recycler, you know, before the internet, you would put something in the newspaper and somebody would be like, oh, we need a guitar case or a head case and sell it for a hundred bucks to some other band. Um, but as, as a short time when I was, I was in a music store and I remember thinking like, okay, tough is done. This is over. And I was in a music store and they had all these buttons and they had a bunch of buttons of Hanoi rocks and they had t-shirts of Hanoi rocks and they had a poster of Michael Monroe. And I liked Hanoi Rocks. And I thought, hold it. This band's been over 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, after Razzle got killed, it was essentially the end. That happened in the end of 1984. So I'm like, I can't end Tough. Even though I'm not playing with Tough right now, even though we're not re releasing a new record or going on the road, there's a brand here. There's a value. That logo, which is like a, you know, a, a branded, you know, like a branding into your eyes. When you see that tough logo, you you know the tough logo. We're looking at it know? right over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, and so the the image we had, you know, that's something that that really sold with Hanoi Rocks as well. I mean, they they were, you know, a band that a lot of people looked at. They saw those photos. They'd have these amazing looking photos, and you know, most know, but you know, to people that are much younger, they don't know that without Hanoi Rocks. You don't have Guns N' Roses. You probably don't have Poison, and you probably don't have parts of Motley Crue either. Hanoi Rocks was there before all of them. And so, but, you know, music-wise, music, music -wise, those early records, they were, you know, they were very, the, the quality wasn't great 
for instance. It was a little bit more punky, but you know, just a, it lacked quality, even though they had put two or three or four records out before the big label, uh, major label debut um, with Million Miles Away and Up and Around the Band and all that. And, uh, you know, so there was a lot of what they sold on based on, uh, you know, I think it was just image. At, at first, you'd look at it, you go, oh my God, who are these guys? You know, you see, and then the names, you know, Nasty Suicide and Andy McCoy and Sam Yaffa and, and 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 Razzle on the drums. And then, of course, Michael singing. There was just an image there. And Tough definitely had an image. You know, we weren't shy about the way we looked. We wanted to present and present ourselves not like a road crew or not like the average guy in the corner. So there was a lot of uh, imagery that Tough produced over the years with image, you know, with photos and and posters and all that stuff. And at some point I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to let this die. So I continued to sell tough when the internet kicked in, which was after the band had broke up. I, right. I registered, a, you know, a web, a web.com, toughcds.com. And then, you know, I'd for, formed RLS records, my own ind independent label to manufacture and print CDs. And at the time, even cassettes and VHS and sell them. And then uh, I continued to do that even after the band had broke up went off and did a few other projects and worked a normal job. And it wasn't until after, you know, 2000 when I reformed the band with, you know, the first song being the American hair band, which was basically my theme of, you know, it was kind of a continuation of what was the all new generation a decade earlier that I wanted to make a little comeback and then do it with some kind of new styled music, which, you know, that song originally was going to be a mosh, a mashup of, like a Marilyn Manson song, a Power Man 5000 song, a Kid Rock song, a Corn song, like I had all this stuff working together to, to recreate this American hairband song about that era, but with more modern music. But then at some point it just kept fil filtering back to the Kid Rock song only, which was technically a, a Metallica riff. Right. And um, so yeah, I just didn't want to let it go. I didn't want to let it go. Say, and here I, mean, I am 30 years later. What's funny about that song is that if you listen to the debut Tough album, there, there's a, you know, one of the songs, you're talking about the guys on the scene, you know, and you talk yep. about Axel and Poison in, in that song. So it's kind of fun that when American Hair Band comes out, it feels like kind of a throwback to that. And that was, I think there was a lot of people, you, you really hit a chord with people because people were sick of these other bands and they wanted to hear that music that they grew up on. And that was the time when those bands were starting to come back and they were starting to do the package tours and, and gigs were yep. happening. And so you definitely hit that at the right at the right time. And maybe also got some people to go back and listen to Tough. We should go back 30 years, though. You know, Stevie, I got to tell you, I've been waiting 30 years for this release to honestly listen to the record. I am so late to the Tough party. I know your later music and because I've seen you later, but I just right. wasn't that familiar. Growing up in New York City, Danger, Danger. Trickster, these were the East Coast um, right. scene bands. So you would see them all the time, whereas Tough was an LA band. I think also Tough gets this kind of bad rap. I think you get lumped in with these bands that came out much later. Now, part of that is because the record came out in 91, but you moved to Los Angeles in 87. So right. Tough is really out there working it, playing the shows, um, paying your dues. And so people think that, oh, well, they just, this is something that got signed real late and it's just, it's just sort of filler, but that, that's not the case. So you tell me when you come to LA, Jim Gillette, who later goes on to be the singer for Nitro, he was singing for Tough, but I guess he was leaving, right? So tell me about how that transitions happens. Correct. Correct. So what happens, what happens is Tough, Tough is actually formed in Phoenix, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona by Todd Chase, Chase, the bass player. Chase, Chase. Nicknames, real last name is Chase on, and George DeSaint, the the guitarist. So they formed the band in late '84, going into early '85. They they formed Tough, and they start playing around the Phoenix scene, and um, they were playing a little bit heavier style of music at first. Todd's older brothers influenced him a lot. Uh, his older brothers being Kenny Chase on, who was in Keel, and Greg Chase on, who was in Badlands and Surgical Steel, and was on deck to be in Ozzy a couple of times. So Todd was raised in a, in a metal family. And because of his older brothers, who also were hanging out with all the people on the metal scene out there, Icon, um, 
Flotsam and Jetsam, Sacred Reich, Rob Helford was living in Phoenix at the time. There was a lot of heavy music in Phoenix. So Todd and George were really into that first. But when they played locally a couple of times, they ended up opening for this band that came from LA called Poison. And Poison's thing was, uh, you know, and this was in 85, you know, uh, mid late 85. It was a lot of, you know, a lot of women. The, the girl ratio to guy ratio was 10 to 1. And at some point they said, you know, we should do this as they called it party rock mm -hmm. or what Stephen Piercy would refer to as fashion rock before it was called glam or hair bands or something like that. They were like, man, these party songs, this Van Halen kind of stuff is, is, is cool. So they kind of, they kind of evolved themselves from being a little bit more riffy and busy Judas priest, iron maiden, scorpions, rocker guys to let's, let's do this party stuff. So they started playing um, a little bit more to the fashion side of it. Jim's their singer. At some point, they decide to move to Los Angeles. So they moved to, to L.A. in the summer of 1986, and they released their first, the debut EP called Knock Yourself Out. That was a four-song demo that they did at the infamous Baby O Studios, and um, hit the ground running, started playing L.A., played Gazaris, played the Country Club, played the Troubadour, played the Sunset Strip, hung out, you know, mixed in with everybody went to hang out and see guns and roses and everything like that but at some point jimmy got jim gillette who was jimmy lamore while he was in tough wow. he wanted to go heavier he wanted to do the heavier stuff he wanted to do more screams they didn't want to do that so they kind of amicably split and uh, at the at the same time jim also had just launched his metal power vocal lessons which were being sold in rip magazine and a bunch of magazines like that and it was very successful. And by the way, Jimmy was the youngest guy, um, probably 18 at the time. Michael was 18 or 19. Todd and George were, uh, you know, uh, on the door of 20. And um, so Jimmy leaves the band. The last show he plays with them is spring of 87. They're immediately looking for a singer. One of my friends who was a drummer just happened to come out to L.A. in the spring, went to all the clubs, went to go see shows, collected all the stuff that everyone handed out, magazines, Rock City News, BAM, flyers, tickets, stubs, whatever. And he came back to Oshkosh, told me about his trip, showed me all this stuff. I'm looking through it. And I saw all these crazy bands, the Zeros. These guys had purple hair and nipples sewn all over their clothing and Creature, these guys that looked you know, like Kiss with stack heels and Fatal Attraction, a guy that was like a vampire that had his girlfriend on a leash and he'd drag her around on the street, you know, all this crazy stuff. But at one point, this flyer pops open and it's it's the Tough logo and it's four blocks, Todd, George, Michael, and an open square that said wanted lead singer influences Van Halen, David Lee Roth, Vince Neil, Billy Idol, Poison, uh, Cheap Trick. And I was like, this is my gig. This is my gig. And so I, I called a number, which happened to be a rehearsal studio in uh, Canoga Park called Rocking Horse Studios. And what I did, got the lady on the phone, told her I was wanting to do the audition. And she said the band had their phone disconnected. So they were having the messages left there. Um, shocking they couldn't pay their phone bill so she said what you need to do is send us a package uh she wanted like a demo uh, eight by ten a publicity still any press anything that i had and it all sounded so professional which i didn't have anything that was really professional so i thought you know this isn't going to work for me i want to go there so i find out on friday and make the call on saturday i immediately make the decision I don't want to send a package. I don't think what I have is up to par. I move all my stuff out of my apartment into my mom's basement that weekend. Monday, I go to the Oshkosh Travel Agency in downtown Oshkosh, and I buy a one-way ticket for $106 flying out of Midway Airport, not O'Hare, mm -hmm. but Midway, a smaller airport south of Chicago. And on that Thursday, my buddy drives me to Midway. I get on a plane with a suitcase and 140 bucks. And I came here. So that was six days later. And um, then I started digging in. How do I get a hold of these guys called again? The lady said, we never got your package. I said, I'm here. Give them this number. I'm at this apartment in Van Nuys and they called me. So. Yeah. And I got to say again, people got to go to the tough diaries 
because you tell these stories, but you also tell more and in, in so much detail. Um, right. Obviously, if things were meant to work out. You the, the guys were close. You guys went. You hung out. You got to know each other, and you get the gig. I got to go back though to the Metal Method uh, cassettes, the Vocal Power. Right. Is it true that when you joined the band, you actually got the Metal Method tapes? They gave them to me the first night I met them. I arrived here on a Thursday, went out to the Troubadour with some friends in the building that took me to a show, which was Angora with John Karabi on Friday night. Over the weekend, I had called the Rocking Horse people and Michael called me on Monday. So it was about three or four days later. Michael calls me and he says, hey, this is Michael from Tough. I'm looking for Steve because I was Steve still. I wasn't Stevie yet. And um said, yeah, this is me. And he's like, blah, blah, blah. Where are you from? What's What do you look like? How long is your hair? Those were the questions. It wasn't how good of a singer are you? How much experience do you have? It was like, what do you look like? And how long is your hair? And uh, at that point, you know, everybody in the world said I was, you know, the Brett Michaels twin. So I was like, I look like the guy from Poison. That's what everybody says. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like David Lee Roth. Huge fan of Vince Neil. Uh, those are the bands I like, and I, I like this Poison band too. Who had only been, only really been in on my radar for eight, ten months, because I'm from Oshkosh. So it's not like Poison was a popular band in Oshkosh, at least not until the early part of '87 when Talk Thirty to me like exploded on MTV. So he says, "Where do you live?" And I says, "I live in Van Nuys, and I live on. I'm staying on a street called Sherman Way, in the cross street." is by a 7-Eleven, it's, uh, it's called Hazelton. I didn't know how to pronounce it. He goes, you mean Hazeltine? I said, yeah. He goes, wow, that's weird. We live on Van Owen and Hazeltine. Anybody that knows LA, Van Owen and Sherman Way are parallel and they're separated by like about a half mile. Mm -hmm. So out of all the places I could have ended up when I flew from Wisconsin to LA, I could have ended up in Redondo Beach, Santa Monica, Venice, Camarillo, Huntington Beach. I could have been in like a hundred places. Yeah. I literally was a a half a mile from their apartment. So he says, we're going to come over on Wednesday to meet you. We have stuff to do today and tomorrow. So they come in and when they came in, they brought me their press package, which looked great. They had their debut EP. And then they said, Oh, this is our old singer. Here's his, his vocal method tapes. You might've heard of them. It's called metal power. And they had like the pamphlets and the whole deal. And they're like, if you want to start practicing your voice training, here's the stuff. So on the very first meeting, yeah, they gave me the tapes. They gave me the pamphlets. They gave me all their stuff. Um, and it looked great. But I was like, eh, let's not worry about that. Let me play you my tape first. Now, I pull out my Exciter demo, which is on a Memorex 90-minute tape, you know, been taped over and written on with a marker. Um, I was confident, you know. I don't know if it could be construed as cocky and arrogant, but I was just confident, and they liked that. And I thought their stuff was cool as well. As soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, this is this is right up my alley. It was right in the in, in the vein of the Motley, Brad, right. Bon Jovi, Poison, Van Halen. Yeah. Now, did you do the Metal Method tapes? Because I did. I sang I did. the Minor, Minor Minds and... Minor, Minor, Mine. Minor, Minor, Mine. Yeah, all of it. I did. Yeah. It did you more good than it did me, but... Um... But this, I think people watching can probably relate because he sold a million of those tapes. He did. He did. And, um, uh, but I could never hit the, you know, that, you know, check this out. And then the, the, the drum machine kicks in with the bass and the rhythm guitar. And he's like, Whoa! And he does this yeah. long scream. Yeah, I never got to where I could do that. But <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah he, every episode he had that to check this out. Starts real low, gets real high to that glass shattering thing. Right. Listen, right. I think Tough made the right move. What Jim did with Nitro was completely different than right. what you did with Tough. I think you added a commercial, um, not just a look, but your your everything you did about it was good. And you know what? You being a sober guy as you read these things was incredibly rare at that time, but probably right. really beneficial to that band because you were, like you said, focused. And you were able to do things that a lot of guys would have been, you know, off uh, doing drugs and, and not not caring so much. And you were really focused right. on your career. Um, so, OK, so you, you you get a chance to, you know, we're, we're jumping around again. If people want it all, they go to the, these diaries. But right. 
Uh, you get signed to Atlantic Records. This is huge. 1990. You know, you listen, and wasn't this isn't overnight. I'm skipping over a, a lot of shows. You guys right. went out, played as much as you could, networked as much as you could. You get this record the record deal with Atlantic. This is huge. I mean, you know, you're on the same label as Led Zeppelin now. Um, right. You know, it's... it's ABC, DC. Yeah. And you you have to be thinking. You know, now we look back at these times and we have... Our own, I should have done this, it could have been that. At the time, you're thinking, this is it. This is it. I, I made it. I'm going to be poison. You know, I'm, I'm sure, right? Is that what's going through your mind, that this is going to be no. huge? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, it's not. Okay. I never, even at the height of the height, I, and I could say collectively we, we were so grounded. Mm. We were so skeptical. We were so, is this real? Hold it. Is this a joke? Really? Are we really? like because like you just said, they formed in you know, New Year's Eve of 1984. Todd and George were watching uh, TV at a friend's house partying, and there was a commercial for a new movie coming out called Tough Turf. Mm -hmm. That's where they got the name. The early Tough Flyers, they took the Tough Turf promo, they cut off the word turf. So it just says tough and it's kind of at an angle. That's where the, the idea came from. So this is New Year's Eve of 84 to 85, they played with, you know, locally in 85 in Phoenix, into 86. I joined in 87. 88, we, we start stretching out. We're playing the West Coast. We went to the Midwest for a couple. By 89, we went into the Midwest. We're playing Kansas City, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Omaha, St. Louis, Dallas, Austin, Albuquerque, Phoenix, Salt Lake, San Diego, Oakland, Fresno. I mean, we literally went everywhere this side of the Mississippi, the West side, half the United States. We had played hundreds of shows. So now it's 1988, 1989. Now we get a record deal. And we never thought, okay, now we're just going to cash checks. We just, we also realized from the beginning, we had done it long enough that we realized now the work starts. Our competition is no longer Paradise or Hysteria or New Haven or Creature or Brunette or London or whoever was on the scene still. Now our competition, and this was Michael, the youngest guy in the band, the drummer was always like, dude, your competition, it's Steven Tyler. It's David Lee Roth. It's Vince Neil. It's Brett Michaels. It's Axl Rose. Like Those are the guys that you have to compete with. We have to compete at that level. It's no longer about blowing away Crystal Pistol, who opened up for us at Gazari's one night. Like that's not in, that's not impressive. It's no longer about playing Hollywood or Orange County or even Vegas and Fresno. Now we got to go beyond where we went. We got to play Boston and Dallas, in Florida, in Atlanta, in New York City, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Columbus. So we always knew there was a lot of work ahead. It was a great feeling to be signed, but we also realized that we're now at the starting line. Right. Everything we had done, years, hundreds of shows, tons of press and magazines across the, not only the United States, but into the into Europe, Kerrang, Metal Forces over in Europe, fan mail from Germany and Japan. and But we realized that the starting line was now, and we were just starting to record our first record. And- you know, you guys were signed very late. Were, were you guys scared at that point? Because get, to get signed in 90, the bands that you were playing with, at least the ones who became successful, were already signed and had an album out. I'm going to quote somebody who just recently was on your podcast. Okay. Every time somebody gets signed, that's one less golden ticket out there. Uh -huh. Those are the infamous words of Jizzy Pearl. He said it. And it's true. Every time a band got signed and being on the strip, being in that war and everybody's like, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Her warrant is working with Prince. No way. There's no way. Why would Prince work with Warrant? You know, like and then at some point, you know, Pretty Boy Floyd comes along. I talked about this in the other in another interview recently. They literally played six, seven, eight shows inside of about 10 months and got signed to MCA Records. And Bang Tango also. Bang yeah. Tango as well. But, you know, Mark Knight and Joe and, and Kyle Kyle were in different bands. As a matter of fact, I think City Slick, which was one of their earlier versions of the band, played with us at the Country Club. Um, 
you know, Mark and the guys from the Bullet Boys was an, you know, offshoot of, you know, what remnants of King Cobra. And they played a couple of showcases and then got a deal. And so, yeah, there was there was some bands that put the thing together, did a few showcases and six shows. And then suddenly, boom, they're signed. And then there's a band like Tough who'd been beating, you know, beating down doors for years. I mean, Poison was doing that for several years and their guitarist at some point got, you know, run ragged and just said, Oh my God, you know, my, my girlfriend's going to be pregnant. I, 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 you know, she's pregnant. I have to, I'm going to have a kid. I, I guess I have to quit the band. And they were literally on the verge of their, their big deal, but they couldn't convince them to stay. And Matt Smith quit the band and then they auditioned a couple guys slash Flash. And, CC and a few others and pick CC. And then six months later got a deal and, and then put out their record. And even, you know, the, they didn't go platinum overnight. Mm-hmm. They they put out the first record with the first single, Cry Tough, open for Quiet Riot, um, played clubs, played with loudness, all kinds of, you know, obscure little one-offs here and there. But it wasn't until Talk Dirty to me hit in the late winter of 86, early 87, almost a full eight, 10 months later, where the song just fucking exploded. It was like smoking in the boys' room or something. It just blew up. And now this little club band is now on their way to double and triple platinum. So with tough, we definitely got signed late, but like Jizzy said, every time somebody got signed, we're like, fuck, you know, how many more record deals are there going to be? Uh, you know, salty dog got one love, hate got one bang tango. And then we're hearing about these East coast bands. Like we didn't know everybody on the East coast, but all of a sudden I'm reading about skid row. And then we saw the video for Youth Gone Wild. We're like, these guys are fucking awesome. Um, and then Trickster and and, and 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 the list goes on. So yeah, we we felt like when is our turn? Because yeah. we were at we were at the top of the crop, you know, in in what could be easily considered the most competitive market at that time in in the rock and roll world. In the heart of Hollywood. We were we were we were basically walking in the footsteps of Jim Morrison before us, David Lee Roth before us, Nikki Six before us, Piercy, even even Slayer and Metallica and all those bands were playing the scene before us. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction. So we knew we were in the right area, but we were like, fuck, we couldn't get arrested as far as the real deal was concerned. And and so to be one of the bands that gets signed later, sometimes a lot of bands are getting signed because they're grabbing what they can at the end and then the labels are competing. Well, they got this band, we better get something similar. And right. unfortunately that can also ha- hurt, get you lost in the shuffle because now it's like, if you don't, you don't have as much time as the other bands. You have to get something out fast and, can, and compete. And right. Luckily, you guys started doing that. But so let's talk about making that record. Howard Benson. Now Howard Benson is this huge producer. He's worked with bands like My Chemical Romance. He's got some resume. But at the time, he was sort of cutting his teeth with some of these uh, hard rock bands as well. The tough album, the one that we're talking about, uh, 30 years later, what comes around goes around. This this album, it's not, a, I think your image doesn't really sum up what the record is. And I think we're, gonna, we're looking at a, one of the first copies right here. Um, this is the actual, this is the actual vinyl, which was only released in Europe. The vinyl's real hard to find. And then of course, most people have seen, you know, the CD floating around on eBay. And this was also released on cassette as well. So that's an original that you show me on vinyl. That's an original. That's an original Atlantic Records vinyl. Um, and again, the vinyl only was only released in Europe. In Europe, it was a CD and vinyl. In America, it was a cassette and a CD. And in Japan, it was a, a CD only with a, right. a the what do they call it? The Obi strip. And then inside, there's like a Japanese insert that's all written in Japanese, except for you see your name pop up, Stevie Rochelle. Right. Or, um, but yeah, but that, but anyway, the, but it's. What we're celebrating is the 30th anniversary. Now, for the first time in America, you can buy that at a reasonable price. You can go to toughcds.com and you can uh, you can buy this and, and hear it. And it looks just like what you have, but you added all kinds of cool stuff. But what I, what I was saying about that record is that I think people looked at Tough and just assumed that this was a filler band. But the right. arrangements on the album are, are more involved than that. And actually, in some ways, it might have hurt you that I think that the, so- the songs are different. I think that maybe right. if it would just been one style from start to finish, 
maybe they could have pawned you off with, with other bands, but I think that you guys and Howard Benson were probably going for something a little bit more. Well, and that goes back to Todd and George's roots. You know, if you listen to the record, Todd is a Todd is a very busy bass player. You know, Todd was uh, all about the riffs. If you listen to Lonely Lucy, Ain't Worth a Dime, Spit Like This, there's a lot of almost progressive style music going on in there. And there's a few people that have played with us over the years and jammed with us that got in the studio and they were just like, hold it. This is, there's time changes and there's more complexities to this than I thought there was going to be. Because people just saw the one video that was on MTV on, you know, the dial MTV with the power ballad. Right. D-A-C-G. There's four chords in it, you know, uh, a very basic song. But there is some some more sophisticated parts going on. And this goes back to Todd and George being influenced by Iron Maiden. And, you know, George was a huge fan of Van Halen, you know, Eddie Van Halen and, and Randy Rhodes. And there was a, a lot more complexities and arrange, like you said, arrangement wise, there's a lot more going on with, with half the songs. There is some basic, some basic stuff in there. All new generation is pretty much like a kiss kind of song. So many seasons, kind of an up tempo, almost. Sounds like house. It sounds like Do Ya by, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, the uh, EL, I think it's uh, ELO, Do Ya. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. That DAG, so, uh, you know. It, it is crazy, though, to have somebody say, you guys remind me of this song by ELO, which, you know, Electric Light Orchestra. I don't hear that often, but occasionally somebody with a little bit more musical knowledge will pick that out, as opposed to somebody that just looks at the photo and goes, oh, these guys are fucking poison. Um right. Which, hey, you know, at the time, that was that was a golden ticket. You know, me looking the way I look, I believe helped us a lot. But at the same time, you know, I'm willing to, to acknowledge and know that it, it kind of hurt us a little bit because there was that, hey, this is just a Brett Michaels lookalike or a Poison wannabe. But when Van Halen came out, you know, there was some naysayers that thought, okay, this guy's, you know, Jim Dandy or Ted Nugent. and. Right. Uh, you know, even though Dave wasn't playing guitar like Ted, but, you know, and then when, when Vince Neil and Motley Crue, it was like, they were like Kiss. And when Poison came out, it's like, oh, these guys want to be Van Halen. You know, when Warrant came out, okay, this guy's like that guy as well. And, you know, there's, it's, it's real hard to not be the original, you know? I mean, and every time there's a, a whole group that goes before you, whether it's Dangerous Toys or Danger Danger or Trickster or Bang Tango and Bullet Boys and, all the different bands that comes before us, they're also okay. Well, they're trying to be, you know, people said the Van, uh, Bullet Boys were trying to rip off Van Halen. They had the same producer and there was some, some elements to the songs that were very Van Halen-esque, but it's, it, it's definitely an uphill battle, you know? And so um, Howard was great though. And you're right. Howard wasn't a super known producer at the time. He had produced Sweet F.A. He had produced Bang Tango, um, King of the Hill, and then, um, and then we got involved with him. He he was great with us. Howard taught us a ton, um, but it wasn't until a little bit later that he really got you know a couple of breaks. And one of the first really big bands he produced was Hoobastank, who had a number one with the Reason. Um, Pod was in there, and then Daughtry, and I mean, just the list goes on now. The last fifteen or twenty years, but Howard benefited from the fact that he wasn't a huge name from the eighties. So when that nineties thing ushered in. A lot of those bands, they didn't want to work with Michael Wagner right. or Bob Rock or Bo Hill or Ted Templeman or anybody that had anything to do with the Def Leppards and the Motley Crues and the Poison. They wanted something different. And the same thing kind of happened with, with the bands. Once you're established as Tough or Bang Tango or Warrant or Slaughter, and then the 90s happened, there was a whole, uh, no thanks. You know, we want the Nine Inch Nails or the Power Man 5000s or the Smashing Pumpkins or the Corns. And um, it was it was definitely there was a, a changing of the guard. And it it didn't only affect the bands, but it also affected the, the label people and the producers uh, management and everything. Yeah, that's an interesting thing I never thought of. In some ways, everyone associated was now guilty, you, you know, right. this next uh, generation, I should say. Um so okay, so you guys record the record, and again, 
I, I can't say it enough, the tough diaries on Metal Sludge. <laughs> if you really want to know what it was like to be in the studio with these people and have famous people coming in, having Brett Michaels write a song that appears on the record, um, there's no way that I can do it justice without you got to read these stories because they're uh, they're really wild and, and uh, it's and it's fun and it's going to be new to most people. So record comes out. You guys start playing as much as you can. Did you feel like we're behind and we got to catch up? I mean, yes and no. But for the most part, you're you're so busy. You know, when you get a record deal and you're on a label at that level, like we were flown to New York a couple times just to do press. So they fly the whole band from L.A. to New York City. We're at the Novotel, 15th floor. And the whole week is just pick us up in a limo, take us to the record company, do press all morning, order lunch from someplace, you know, bring in catering, whatever we eat, do some more press. Then when they're done, they pick us up in a town car. They take us to some restaurant. Then we go out, you know, to some club at night, like the limelight, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, go back to the hotel, order some room service on the label, of course, ring yeah. up the bill and then rinse and repeat. And then, okay, now we're going on tour. And when you get set up with a tour, it's funny. Bands going out for two days or five days or 10 days. That's not, that's not a tour. I mean, it is, I guess, to, to some extent when you're young and starting out. But once you have a major label record and you're, the machine starts moving, we played like 100 shows in 91. And there's bands that play more than that. Like we went out on one run. We left like in June. We didn't come back until late October. And we were home for like 10 days. And then we went out for six or seven more weeks. So basically from the month of June until like a couple days before Christmas, we were gone. Literally the entire United States twice to England. There's so much going on. And at that point, the internet didn't exist. So you couldn't really pick up on everything that was happening on a daily basis. A lot of it would be secondhand knowledge through friends of friends, or you'd do a one-off with Dokken or Saigon Kick or whoever you might play with. You'd share your little, hey, this is our, this is our world. That's your world. Okay, cool. You guys are cool. You guys are dicks, whatever. You have good times, bad times. Then you move on, you do the next gig. And by the time you do that for two, three weeks, two, three months, you forget about Frederick, Virginia. You forget about what happened in Cincinnati that night. You have you 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 might remember Vegas because you know it's Vegas, but there's certain things that just memories fade and you just have to go through the motions. And of course, you do get the reports. Hey, guess what? We're pulling into Salt Lake City. K Bear is playing the shit out of your song. They want you there at one o'clock for an, an afternoon interview. They want you to play I Kiss You Goodbye acoustically. And then we'd be like, oh my God, I'm fucking wrecked. My throat's sore. I'm tired. Okay, George gets a guitar. Michael's got a shaker. Now we're in some studio with one little mic and three people going, it's so great to see you. And we're like, cool, it's great to see you too. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, three days earlier, we were in London. You know, a couple days earlier, we were in Denver. And, you know, and it's, it's just, so, it's a whirlwind. It's so important to these fans, but they don't realize. I mean, I've traveled with bands and someone comes over with a record and goes, I bet you don't see this very often. Well, we've seen it every night in every city, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know right? they're, they're excited. They've been holding on right. to this thing and this is important to them. But yeah, it's your going through the motions. I mean, I, I, I've been in cities where you go, hey, after the show, well, let's go to that store on the corner and then you go oh wait we're in a different city that store on yeah the that corner. was that was a couple days ago that that we're not at that same hotel anymore yeah and, and it just all starts to run the same which in right. some ways is really exciting but in other ways you know greg Steele from faster pussycat he did one of these where are they now things and he said it's like being picked up in a twister and you're being spun all around and it's crazy and it's happening for, and then it just drops it right back off where you started and right it's all, you know and i thought that was an interesting way for some of the bands, you know, right. In your case, as you said, you realized there was some value to this brand and you were going to work it. Um, was there, and, and you did, and you did keep most of the guys together as you made other tough records that you did independently. I think Todd is the only one who wasn't on the follow-up records. Is that right? Well, yeah, the, the, after the Atlantic record, Todd had quit and, 
Michael and me and George stayed together and we got a new bass player, Danny Wilder. Uh, rest in peace, Danny. Uh, Danny's not here anymore. He's went on to other ventures, you know, 12, 14 years ago. Um, so we did um, we did some recordings for Atlantic for our second record. Mm -hmm. uh, demos, which included God Bless This Mess, In Dogs We Trust, Rattle My Bones, Electric Church, Better Off Dead, et cetera, et cetera. Those were, those were funded by Atlantic. Um, and then we, we had meetings with Jason Flom and Kevin Williamson, which, you know, agreed to disagree that they didn't like what we were doing. And within a couple of, uh, 24 hours of that meeting, we were dropped. So then what we did is we took those recordings and then we shopped it to some other labels that were interested. And we signed a deal in late 92 into 93 with Grand Slam IRS. Grand Slam was run by Brian McAvoy and they had put out a White Lion record. Do you know who Brian is? Because he's an East Coast guy, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think I know him though. Okay. So they had put out, I think the first White Lion record. Um, they put out a record by a band called Cry Wolf, who was from LA. There was a couple other, and it was, again, that was an indie Grand Slam through IRS, which used to be a pretty big company. But in the 93 is when IRS had some big problems and they basically went bankrupt and the bank, the whole, the whole label dissolved the music side of it. So then grand slam was labelless and the advance they had given us for our second set of recordings, which were Atlantic paid demos. Now the masters reverted to us. And that was at the end of 93 into early 94. When I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just going to be my own record label. And I opened up a music connection. And I found a, a, a place to get the, the stuff mastered. I you know, found a place to get a UPC code, a barcode. I found a place to do graphics, found a place to do replication uh, in both formats, CD and cassette. And so then uh, that's where I formed RLS Records. And the RLS stood for Record Labels Suck Records because I was so fed up with records. Uh, with record labels um or it could also be rochelle lyrics and songs if you were correct. Being... alternative meaning uh rochelle's lyrics and songs records so and that was in 1994 that i pressed and released fist first the first independent tough record which was technically our second release technically i guess third if you want to call the tough debut with jim gillette you know their first but um and you know michael was had recorded all that along with George and me and Robbie Crane was actually the bass player on our second set of uh, demos for Atlantic. But, and at that point, Robbie was literally the guy that we were about to go, dude, you should be in our band. And I think Robbie was maybe thinking he would join our band, but he literally got offered the Vince Neil gig literally in that same fracas, like Todd had quit. Robbie started jamming with us. Vince had just quit Motley. And then he put out a single that he had written with Jack Blades, the You're Invited song that was on the Encino Man soundtrack, became a hit. And he needed a band to shoot, to shoot, to shoot the video, which Robbie has talked about this in some of the interviews that Vince basically was like to his brother-in-law, Sharice's brother, Gary, I, I need to get some guys to play in my band, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, dude, you got to get Vicky Fox to play drums. And he's like, who's Vicky Fox? And they're like, dude. If there's ever the guy that could have been as cool as Tommy on the drums, it's Vicky Fox. So then Vince, Robbie helped Vince get the number. So they called Vicky and then Phil Sassoon stepped in and then they, they offered Robbie the gig. So then we were like, oh, I guess we don't have Robbie Crane as our bassist. So then we pulled in Danny Wilder. So. Yeah. So let, let's, um, cause I know people want to hear about Metal Sludge as well. You got a long career, but let's, uh, Let's talk about where the guys from Tough are now, from that right. core lineup. So, um, George uh, DeSaint, what, what's become of him? You know, I I know, but I don't know. George George has had, let's just say he's had a really, he's had a rough go of it with chemicals uh, for many years. Um, I've, I've talked about this online a few times. I've talked about it in some of the interviews. George was always one to partake in the partying but he could never get away from it. And he, he got involved in, 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 the, in the bad stuff. You know, essentially meth has ruined George's life. He might not want to know that or admit that, 
Um, but that's the, that's the, that's the reality. George has battled meth for 30 years and it's taken, you know, and ruined his life aside from the band, even with his family and children and exes and, and all that. So the last I know, George is somewhere out there and, uh, not doing great. Did I lose you there? I see us. No, there, there we go. Okay. Um, George doesn't, wasn't doing great from what I heard, but you know. That's that's his that's his world. Um, Todd, Todd, who left the band, and it was basically because of me. Me and Todd were like fire and ice for years. He left the band, and we didn't talk for probably the better part of a decade. But then uh, at some point, we kind of came around and ran into each other, and you know, made up. And then um, in mid two thousands, two thousand six, seven, eight, something like that. I, I had asked Todd a few times. I'm like, hey, why don't you play with me again? You know, uh, we can go all kinds of cool places. And he was very apprehensive at first. But I said, listen, here's the deal. Let's go to rehearsal. Let's get in the room. Let's just jam. Sunday night, I'll get a room. Let's just go in there and fucking play some songs. See what happens. And we played some songs. We had a blast. We played some more songs. We had some blast, uh, some more blasts. And then at some point, it was like, hey, dude, you want to go to Brazil? Yeah, cool done. I'm booking it. Hey, you want to go play in Mexico? Uh, yeah. Hey, you want to go on the Monsters of Rock cruise? Sure. You can even bring your wife, you know? Okay. Want to go to England? And he's probably seeing that some guys were shocked that it wasn't like it used to be. But for other guys, it's better. You get on a plane for the weekend. Why not? I come home with cash? Great. Yeah. And here's here's the the analogy I've given so many people and I told that to Todd. I'm like, listen, it's not like we're coming back and we're going to put on spandex and do choreography and spray our hair up. You know, there's no hair for me to spray up, you know, so and, and we probably wouldn't look good in spandex anymore. So I said, this is like the old dudes in the Midwest that have a regular job, but every fall they go duck hunting or they go deer hunting or they go ice fishing. Or they have their little guys only trip. You know, I said, dude, we're going to get in a van. We're going to fly into said airport in Dallas. We're going to play Houston. We're going to play Austin. We're going to play such and such, this Rocklahoma or whatever it's going to be. We'll be in some rooms, have some food, see some old friends. We'll, we'll make a few bucks and we'll go home and go back to normal life. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be, you know, driving from city to city for weeks and months at a time. There's not going to be like, okay, rehearsals three nights a week. We don't have to do all that. We just have to get it, like you said. I mean, to go to M3 or to one of these, you know, Hair Nation Live or Cat House Live or a Monsters of Rock Cruise or one of these events, it's a great time. And most of the time, you see everyone backstage and everyone's talking about their kids. Yeah. Some guys are talking about their grandkids or what they're doing with their family or, oh, my side business is, you know, Todd is, it has a food truck and this guy's doing, you know, engineering work and, restoring cars or motorcycles and everybody's just we're in a different phase in our life we're all grown men we're not 22 year old guys trying to see who can smoke the most pot or fuck the most girls anymore that's 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 30 years ago and so, you have cell phones and ipads and laptops so the yeah. travel is faster communication is there you can stay in touch right. with your family and so right. it is there's a lot of perks to this modern day yeah. So Todd, you know, Todd came back in, you know, 2000, uh, whatever it was, six, seven, eight. And, you know, since then we've got to go a whole bunch of cool places. You know, we went to England, we went to multiple Monsters of Rock cruises on the East coast and the West. We played all these different big festivals and we usually put some clubs around it. And here's the thing we know, I know more than ever where we sit on the totem pole on the right. rungs. You know, we're not going to co-headline. We're not going to get the, the second to top slot. We're going to be the first or second or third band on most of those events. We're going to play at two or three in the afternoon. And we're not going to get the guarantees that, you know, the bands that sold three million or five million records are. But that's OK. You know, I'm not going there to just make money off. You know, I'm not trying to live off of that one weekend or that one nightclub. So I I. I do it because I like it. I love it. I enjoy the travel, especially when it comes into going to Europe or something like that, or, you know, being on a cruise and floating around, you know, in some tropical area for a week. And you really only have to play a couple of shows. 
and then have a couple of other events. You basically have a whole week's vacation and everybody brings a wife or a girlfriend. So it's like, hey, go scuba diving for the day. You don't have to do anything till tomorrow night at eight. You know, it's, you nice, get it's nice for the fans because maybe they didn't get to see tough. You, you know, you only got to do so many shows. And so when you're on, I mean, I know I've been on those cruises. I would get the list every morning and I take a look at who's playing. And I went to see the bands that I had missed. Taiketo. Right. I never saw a Taiketo. I'm going to go see that. Right. And right. even some bigger ones, Vixen. I go, well, I never went to see Vixen. And, and you know, it's kind of refreshing and fun because you get to catch up and tough as well. You get to go and you kind of have it. What was old is now new. And that's a really kind of yeah. fun thing. Well, and like you had said earlier about being an East Coast guy, you saw Trickster and Danger Danger in the clubs. You saw Kicks and Britney Fox and all those Spread Eagle, Skid Row. You saw the East Coast bands because they were all in your neighborhood. Yep. You know, even Extreme was up in Boston. You know, the L.A. bands, like Danger Danger didn't play here very often, nor did Trickster, um, nor did Spread Eagle. You know, um, just like Tough didn't play the East Coast all the time. I mean, we're 3,000 miles away. But, yeah. you know, to people in San Diego and Phoenix and Vegas and Fresno and Oakland, they saw all of us a ton. They saw Guns N' Roses as a local band. You know, Poison is local. Tough is local because people would drive to Hollywood. Or some of us would, you know, warrant. We 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 do shows in, in other cities a few hours away from here or one state over. And that's what happens with the cruises. So many people I've seen that go on them from all over the world and they're looking at it like vain is going to be on the cruise. Oh my God. I've never seen vain. I have like no diss to Tracy and Phil, but everybody's seen LA guns at least 20 times. And that's 20 different <laughs> because, versions. Yeah. That's because there's like three LA guns on tour at all times, you know? So you need yeah, three everybody's, cruises. everybody's seen warrant and slaughter and LA guns and great white and faster pussycat they've seen in winger they've seen all those bands a lot of times with all their different singers quiet right and so on and so on but there's a ton of people out there that didn't get the chance to see tough or vein or rhino bucket or or the obscure taiketto the bands that you know um choir boys that weren't on every major tour or every arena tour or don't get to be added to every festival so when they are the people go on those cruises and go wow cool not only am I going to get to see Zane, but I'm going to get to see him twice and go to the meet and greet and probably see Davey and Delana at the salad bar and hang out yeah. with them for a little bit, you know? No, and that's definitely part of it. And listen, you go see Loudness, who may never be allowed in the United States again, you know? So <laughs> but if you well, want to see here, they're not. That, that's a breaking story. Loudness has been, uh, you know, deported in New York City. It's like... But you get on the boat if you want to see those guys, you know, or, or, or right. whatever the situation is. Um, and then last is Michael. We didn't talk about wh where Michael is. Michael is riding high. Um, Michael start. He, he quit the band in 1993. And we knew this was kind of coming. But it's at that point, he was like, I want to start a coffee shop. And I'm like, you mean you're going to start a coffee shop? I mean, think about it. Before Starbucks existed, the only place you had coffee was in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. At work, there would be a Mr. Coffee Maker in the break room or 7-Eleven, right? Those are the only three. There was no coffee bean. There was no Starbucks. There was no tea leaf, you know, you know, Pete's coffee. or None of that existed. But Michael, he had a computer before everybody. He was, you know... Doing all that for every before everybody, and he said 30 years ago, I want to open a coffee shop. We're like, You're gonna sell it. I'm picturing, like, you know, a, you know, coffee one dollar in a styrofoam cup. I'm like, What do you mean you're gonna open a coffee shop? Well, he opened Old New York Coffee in Delhi in 1993 in Camarillo, California, and he's right now looking at opening his fifth location in uh, the border of Sherman Oaks and Encino. His newest is on Topanga Canyon in Woodland Hills next to Amazon Fresh across from um, the very hip Topanga Outlet Mall. And um, it's huge. It's, it's, it's very, very successful. He's got a huge house in Camarillo. He's got a huge house in Mammoth. He owns uh, a place in, in Cozumel. 
he's uh, Michael's always been the smart guy, the business guy, and a um, whole bunch of real estate and um, his business, Old New York Deli. If you uh, you Google it, they have locations in Mammoth, Camarillo, Woodland Hills. There's a Newberry Park, and then he's just he's looking to open one that's in the the Sherman Oaks and Sino area. And he's 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 got a franchise license, so he's basically building it where he's now going to start franchising, and he's the sole owner. Does he have any interest in jamming or anything with you? Does, is there any? Does he still have no. any passion? He 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 loves everything I'm doing. He's super stoked. When I was when I was in the studio mastering um, this record, this is this is um, decadation. This is uh, our recordings from 1988 and 89. When I was in the studio mastering this, he called me. He's like, "Hey, I'm I'm in the area. Where are you?" I was like, "Told me, came over and." He spent the afternoon with me. So everything I do, I send it. I'm like, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And he's like, oh, there's a typo right here. Like he's pointing little things out to me. So he's he's all game. He, he loves what I do. He loves the fact that I'm keeping the flame burning. Um, as a matter of fact, at one of his locations in Mammoth, his staff said, hey, one of the guys from Kiss is here. So Michael peeks his head out and he sees Paul Stanley there with his son, Evan. And so Evan is uh, like snowboarding. So Paul had went up to, to Mammoth with Evan. So they're in Mike, one of Michael's stores eating, and Michael's out doing the, the owner thing. You know, hey, how's, how's your coffee today? How's your bagel? How's your sandwich, sir? And he walks up to Paul, and he says, how's the food? And Paul's like, I love this place. I come here every time I'm up here. And Michael says, yeah, my staff recognized you, and they're big fans. And, you know, I just wanted to say hello. I, I used to be in the music business myself. And he's like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, my name is Michael. I'm a drummer. I, I play. I played in Tough. And Paul looks at him and goes, Tough? You mean Stevie Rochelle Tough? <laughs> and Michael goes, yeah, yeah, I was in that Tough, but I left to do this business. And he goes, tell Stevie I said hi, you know, as Paul's biting into his sandwich. But um, Michael's, Michael's very hands-on with his business, and he always keeps me on my toes as well. Um, Everyone says, is he ever going to play? And I said, you know, if Michael's ever going to play, it's going to be where he shows up at a gig and maybe gets up and plays Good Guys Were Black or All New Generation or a song. But he's such a busy man and a successful man, you know, 100 employees in four or five locations. No. He doesn't have time to be fucking around with us playing uh, with Enough's Enough for, on, a, on a Thursday somewhere. So, you know, yeah. he'll just well, sit maybe, back and watch. Maybe 30 years later, you know, unfortunately – Things are still shut down, but this would have been the time for him to get up and celebrate something that you guys shared 30 years ago for a song or two, like you said. So who knows? It, 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 you're on good terms. That's already a better oh, start yeah. than most of these bands. Yeah, me, Michael, and Todd, are, we're all on the same page. And, you know, the thing is, as far as that's concerned, like you said, to, to celebrate this, this deal that I actually did with Rhino actually came into, came into play last year. But I realized... The whole world was basically, you know, head inside ass for most of last year. So I was like, it doesn't make any sense to pursue anything at this point because the world is basically at a stoplight. And then I thought, well, in six, seven, eight months, it's going to be the 30th anniversary. So it doesn't really make any sense to try to celebrate the 29th anniversary. Let me kind of wait it out. So basically in the process after sorting the deal with rhino the licensing deal we coordinated audio got that remastered got some art files started working on the art they told me the do's and don'ts of what we can and can't do with the reissue and obviously the perfect timing was you know earlier in the month to release it and make the make it official hey we signed this licensing deal with rhino warner and the new uh the newly remastered product is in the manufacturing phase pre-order links are there as you said toughcds.com cds and vinyl it's a deluxe package both of them are, are are amazing and um cds will ship sometime in june and vinyl is going to be down the road because vinyl is definitely a it's a mammoth situation as far as just it, it's it's a time-consuming turnaround to to print vinyl records well, there's only it's, a few plants that make it 
and exactly. everyone wants it and they're backed up and with the pandemic they're even more backed up so yeah so vinyl is going to take a little while but it, look people waited 30 years they can wait a few more months i want to ask yeah. you uh how mm -hmm. difficult was this to get the license back you know to deal with rhino and get the permission to do this well you know people have been asking me for years you know what about the rec record and i was buying cds on ebay or amazon or finding them in you know whatever local outlets whether it was cd stores or perhaps a salvation army or a goodwill i'd rifle through a cd rack and occasionally run across 10 or 15 like mint co copies of all these rare hair bands cds and i'd buy them for a buck mm -hmm. and then resell them and i was doing that with our record for the longest time um and then packaging it with you know other tough related merchandise and memorabilia, but I just started digging in. And then as I saw more and more, you know, Deadline Cleopatra did a licensing deal with MCA Universal some years back to reissue the Pretty Boy Floyd Leather Boys with Electric Toys on a special edition vinyl. And then Rock Candy has done this with certain bands. And then I saw where Kicks had done it a few times and they had Bo Hill remix some tracks. So I reached out to Bo. Bo didn't really know what was up. At some point, I got in touch with the band, and Mark Schenker, the bass player, was the, the main business guy for Kicks. So he kind of turned me on to some people that he dealt with. And for anybody not in the know, Kicks was also on Atlantic. So we were dealing with the same departments as far as tracking down licensing. So Mark came, gave me some information. And also Steve Brown of Trickster knew some people over there. So between Steve Brown of Trickster and Mark from Kicks and a couple other people, I basically started digging in, sending an email, dear sirs, to whom it may concern, blah, blah, blah. This is who I am. This is what I do. And um, one email led to another. Oh, that's this guy. Oh, you need to talk to that department. Oh, let me hook you up with this person. And that was not all overnight. That was, you know, a couple of weeks, a month later, two months, a follow-up, nothing, another follow-up. I'm trying to, to push for information, but at the same time, Again, the whole world's at a stoplight. You know, quote me there. Everything's on hold. So I realized people weren't in offices and not not all concerned about some hairband CD from 29 years earlier. But um, little by little, the the information was there. And then um, I started calling and getting people on the phone that are in charge. And when I finally got, uh, I got this woman on the phone who was was part of the, the team that really needed to approve it, I could tell right away that she was probably like maybe in her 30s. So she was like five when this record came out. Mm -hmm. Probably not her cup of tea, her style of music. Had no idea who I was. Didn't know me from a hole in the ground. And at one point she said, if you want to do this, you have to submit these forms. So then they gave me some forms to fill out. Why I want to do it, who I am, who's my company, what I do, how we're going to proceed and then eventually it just one day we got on the phone and i kind of was pushing to get an answer and she couldn't give me one and then the next day she said oh this is approved and i was like huh it is <laughs> like i'm looking at the email like approved hold it am i reading this right you know and then the whole thing turned into okay well if we're going to do it this is how we have to do it this is going to be your licensing fee I basically prepay a royalty to Rhino to license the record. Obviously, I have the opportunity to remaster my cost, to redesign my cost, but the cover has to stay the same. The tray card has to stay the same. Tray card meaning the back. The insert, the booklet, they said we could extend it. We went from 12 pages to 16. We added photos from the original carousel photo shoot with William Hames, who I've a great working relationship with and i'm actually i own the 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 william hames archive of tough which i did that deal some years ago so i have all the slides from all the photo shoots and so little by little just had to you know a lot of dot dotting of eyes a lot of crossing of t's and a lot of legwork but it 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 paid off and um it it sounds great i mean you had a chance to maybe take a listen and I'm not sure if I'm familiar you were, were with it before that, but I've had some pretty good reactions so far from people that have heard the, the, the remaster. Yeah. And it, it, the, 
The quality is great. That's one of the funny things. You don't listen to it and think I'm listening to something that's 30 years old. Some of these records from 30 years old, production was completely different and right. sounds very thin. This doesn't. You, you can play this. I mean, listen, the style of music is obviously going to be classic right. that people want to hear. But the production is good and it's, and it's very easy um, to listen to. And for Rhino, this is a great deal. This is free money. You know, yep. no one else was doing anything with this thing. Why not? And you were smart enough um, to go after it. Well, and that's the thing. In a lot of these scenarios, the band is not licensing it. Some other label is licensing it. Rock Candy is licensing records to reissue those bands. Um, most of the time, it's it's an independent label. It's not the band. Well, I'm technically the band because I'm the singer, but I'm also I'm also the label. I'm also RLS Records. Yeah. So, um, which I thought would give me an advantage as well for them to be, if there was any way to lean and say, let's do this guy a favor. He's, as you said earlier, you know, uh, in so many words, I've been flying the flag with this thing the whole way. Um, so instead of it just leaving it sit there, it is available digitally through Rhino. Um, but my remasters smoke the original. Um, if you AB it, there's no, there's no, there's no comparison. Um, and so uh, I believe Rhino was actually going to reissue the, the digital as well as a remastered. Um, and so it's kind of a, they scratch my back and I scratch their back as well. So we kind of went back and forth. And uh, again, I'm, I'm super excited the way it sounds, the way it looks. And for people to actually physically hold the CD come, uh, you know, about a month from now, mid late June, once um, those are in the mail, I'm, I'm stoked to see what the reaction is because the packaging is, is amazing as well. We, we, we definitely upped the ante and went into the uh, deluxe level of the packaging and the same with the vinyl. Well, and one of the other things I want to say is that with bands like Steel Panther coming out, which started as a parody, obviously, and still a parody, right. these younger people have found an interest in bands like Tough. They they look at this and they think Steel Panther. Obviously, it's a little bit the other way around. But they're right. going on YouTube, discovering these bands. I see it all the time. The people who are going to these festivals are younger. They're going with their parents. And so for them, because I was listening to this record and I was going, man, if I was a kid into glam and hard rock, this is the, a missing record. This would be a lot of fun to listen to. And I think now that it's going to be more accessible, um, I, I think a lot of people are going to get turned on to it. Well, and that's that's something that we did with Metal Sludge over the years. You know, Metal Sludge started in 1998, and it was essentially the first social network or social media for people that were interested in this kind of music because we were online before any social media was. We were. Well, Stevie, we were, I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut you off on Metal Sludge because what I what I've been thinking because we're past the hour mark is that if you'll indulge me, we'll come right? back for part two and talk about Metal Sludge, because I know so many people want to talk about it, and I have some interesting stuff with that as well. Oh, but, good. Um, so I feel like that's, well, if you're okay with that, we'll make that part too. But I know what you're saying here is that the Metal Sludge website did attract younger fans. It gave people a place to just rediscover these bands. Yeah, and we t we turned people on through, you know, through, uh, through our interviews with just people that were like, obscure to them like yeah they knew about the white snakes and the motley crews and the poisons and the skid rows and the bon jovis but they didn't know about the sleaze bees mm -hmm. they didn't know about slick toxic they didn't know about killer dwarfs you know um and nitro and rhino bucket and tough and kick tracy and all the other obscure little hairband kind of deals that came out and and we we were we were one of those in many ways metal sludge becomes bigger than tough, at least in the modern day. Right. People know this website and they know you, you become a personality. Right. Not, not that you were looking to be one at that point and we'll get all right. into all of that in part two. But so now Stevie Rochelle is out there pushing Metal Sludge, pushing your own records, doing other projects that I think it, you know, it gains new interest in tough. People go, well, mm -hmm. oh, he was the guy from tough. But now right. I think people go back and take a look and toughcds.com all of a sudden you you were smart you kept it marketing and we're co-branding okay i got cds from these other bands for sale and i also have tough and if you like this you'll like tough and you know listen you're you're a hustler and obviously uh, that that's what we're here to do today to get people to go to toughcds.com 
and check out this 30th uh, anniversary remaster uh, and first time ever available on American vinyl. So I hope people do exactly. that. And uh, and Stevie, so you'll come back. We'll talk about Metal Sludge next. Is that is that all right? It's it's all good with me. And yeah, aside from the you know the tough ca the RLS catalog being uh, heavy on the tough, also put out records from Wildside, Nitro, uh, Veins of Jenna, the Swedish band I had managed back in the you know early mid two thousands. Um, some other obscure stuff that you know. Kings of Sunset Strip with John Karabi's Angora, Jailhouse, Tommy Gun, all kinds of different stuff, which uh, also is on RLS Records that you can find uh, at toughcds.com. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of history there. You were smart to sort of get involved with other things. And like I said, co-brand. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So everybody watching, you got to make sure you got to subscribe. You know, Stevie, when you do these things, you got to tell people to like, comment and subscribe or they forget. And then people tell you that you're missing an opportunity that's the that's what i've you learned you mean they gotta smash the like button <laughs> yeah. i try to never say that you know or anything i, know, I saw you i saw you say that before because that's what all the the youtubers say smash the like button <laughs> youtube is painful youtube is worse than hollywood in 91 when everyone thought they were going to get in on it everyone right? is sitting in their house some are good most are not and they have all are doing the same act. They all have the right. same shtick. They've got catchphrases and they've got slogans and they got the smash. Right. And then, and you watch the interviews and they talk to the guy and they say, uh, so you were tough, what was that like? And you know, and that's the extent of that. And then they tell their jokes and they try to push their shtick and, uh, and it's ridiculous. And that's why I forget to say those things. So anyway, let's make sure everybody <laughs> does all that nonsense because it helps. And yeah. now you're gonna stick around because in just a little bit, part two, the metal sludge years. Thanks, Stevie. All good. Thank you, Jason.